All right, so one of the things is, so why do we treat soil like dirt? Um, this dust storm at the Denver airport uh, in the past spring grounded aircrafts. Do you think all those travelers were thinking favorably upon farmers? Not likely. Um, so one of the things, the reason I bring this up is because we as farmers, and yeah, I am a farmer, I'm also a rancher, um, the thing about that is, is that we need to take some responsibility for some of this. And we need to start doing that before we all get legislated into everything. And you don't have a choice. And I think the idea is to always have choices. So, desertification. What is going on in that little yellow triangle? This is, this is about participation here, folks. So, why do you think that is? Speak up, please. Everybody's Okay, anyone else? Sand. It is, it's dunes. It's dune formation in eastern Colorado. And not in the great Sand Dunes National Park either. And not in the San Luis Valley. It's outside of that. So yes, and it actually you can see it extends a little farther. You can see the farms on the other side. And then you can see sand dune formation. So desertification is not just in Africa. We need to think about it ourselves. And then the question is to tell or not? Is there really a question? Well, there are questions because we have compassion issues. Um, we may have weed management issues if we are in an organic system. And I know I'm speaking to organic farmers in here too. The other thing is that some people, I don't know if CRP program is very popular here, but in Montana it's very popular. Um, and in parts of northern Washington and as I go through the Dakotas and that, we still have CRP. Um, and a lot of people think they need to till that up too. I'm here to tell you that you don't. And there are ways to manage it. And if you have livestock, there are even better ways to manage it. But the question there is, is do, can we really afford to lose any soil? Last night I tweeted that um, one of the farmers was actually speaking right now. Um, he was talking about uh, in Minnesota, and, and he's in western Minnesota, and he was talking about the fact that if you buy a house up on the hill on the Minnesota River, you can watch all the farmland float by. <laughs> and that is a sad comment. So, you know, he said we have all these people interested in, in cleaning up the river and whatnot, but we, we as farmers have not thought about that into it, you know, close to our heart. So we need to pay more attention to that. So all I'm here to tell you is that I am going to talk, so in case you have a guest already, I'm going to talk a lot about not tilling so much, and if possible, I am also going to refer back to this diagram, so we're going to try and embed that in our heads right now. So biology at the top, chemical and physical properties on either side of soil health. And the reason for that is, is as we go through the presentation, you're going to see that it's the chemical, that the, phys, the biology unites the chemical and the physical properties. And they actually drive that whole system. So if you don't have the biology, then you're using iron and you're using man-made man -made tools in order to actually integrate everything or to take over for the biology. And that's not what we want. We want the biology to be doing everything. We just want to augment what they do. That, that should be our goal in my view. Then we talk about soil productivity, and most of us are going to think about yield. And that's what we're going to think about, right? I mean, well, how many bushels do I have of this? How many tons of this? How many pounds of this? But is it any good for you? Is it any good for your animals? Think about that. You know, a number of you, and some of you in here might be livestock producers. You think about what's good for your animals. You think sort of about what's good for yourself. <laughs> But the point is, is that we want to make sure that we are thinking a lot about what is in those, what is in our food. And how, am I putting all the nutrients from my farm? Am I giving, being efficient with my water, with my nutrients? And is it going into my food or is it flushing out? We want to pay attention to that. And then if we can put everything into our food, then we have healthy animals and we have healthy results and we have a healthy environment. So it's a, it's a triple win there. So that's the kind of thing that we're going to go after. So what really characterizes a healthy soil? You're going to hear a lot about healthy soil and what is the soil health and things like that in the next little while if you haven't already. Because now there is a lot of money in soil health in the USDA and the NRCS. 
So we're going to hear a lot more about soil health. But what really is it? Well, first thing is that soil should be alive. That's the first part. They should have good soil structure, and they should the, the services within them should be functioning. Not waiting to function, but actually functioning. So we want to limit soil erosion. One of the other things we want to limit soil erosion is because that top part that you're always eroding, the top part of the soil, is where all the microarthropods are. So you're not only eroding the soil itself, but you're actually eroding a living part of it. And they're all floating down the river too. And that's not really what they wanted to do, is go find another resource patch in quite a dramatic way. Um, increased nutrient cycling. Well, we need that because we need to recycle the nutrients all the time. Increase, we want nutrient availability, water holding capacity. Certainly we want to be biodegrading toxic substances, especially if you're a traditional farmer or even a low input farmer. We want to make sure that we are biodegrading all those things all the time. Diversity of soil organisms and healthy nutrient dense plants. Those are sort of the resulting things. I'm talking about biodegrading a little bit because um, most people don't understand. Um, soil bacteria will eat almost anything if they're starved for energy. So what is glyphosate? Glyphosate. So they will eat the glide part of it, leaving the phosphate behind, especially if they are phosphate starved. So, and the other thing is we can do bioremediation. We're using cocktails of microorganisms to break down some really horrible things because they'll do that. Now, I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying that there are some ways, and if we take care of ourselves, we can start to regenerate them. We can rejuvenate them. We can rehab them. I'll use the term rehab because I think some of it we just need to rehab them. And I, want, I don't want, I mean, I hear over and over again, my microbes, the microbes, I'm looking at the microbes, the microbes. You know, microbes are food. And they are what drive, they are the food source, the primary producers that drive nutrient cycling. And if you don't have any of these guys, nothing happens. In fact, the microbes just starve your plants. Because they are way better at competing for nutrients than your plants can ever hope to be. So they, and when we talk about nitrogen immobilization, or you start seeing plants starving, even though you've been taking care of your soil, then you go, what the heck? That Jill, she's full of it. I got, I mean, I got good soil, and my plants are starving. Well, you got a lot of microbiology, but we got no predators. So we're not turning things over. And part of the talk about soils as a habitat is because we need predators. We need things that eat other things, because otherwise the bacteria get out of hand, the fungi get out of hand, and nothing is eating them up. So really, nutrient cycling and healthy soils are about maintaining and escalating predator-prey relationships. That's what it's about. Now look at some of these things. Aren't they gorgeous? Look at that. Now this one doesn't have a whole lot of mouth parts um, that are really gruesome looking. But um, one thing I want you to notice is you see all the hairs on them. Um, and you don't notice that there's no eyes, but they have because why would you need the eyes in a dark place? You don't, but you need to sense the vibration. And these little guys are amazing. And actually, every species of one of these mites has their own vibration because of the pattern of the hairs on them. And so that's how they tell one from another, is because of their vibration. So, I mean, although they look quite prehistoric and they don't look like they're all that clever, they're actually incredibly clever. Okay, characteristics. We're going back to healthy soils. You cannot have predator-prey relationships if you don't have good soil structure. Because these guys don't bore. They have no boring capacity. They can't tunnel. So if you don't create this great soil structure, then how can they move? How can they get to the bacteria? How can they get to the fungi if they can't zoom around on a continuous soil-poor network? Yeah, the soil structure is infrastructure. So just like we need infrastructure in our great cities where they're well populated, soils need, if we're going to have healthy soils with lots of living things in them, then we need good infrastructure. 
So soil structure is one of the key things. And that's why they do all these soil structural demonstrations all the time at MCS, is to show you how important soil structure is. Now, the good news about that is, is as we get healthy soils, the animals actually start to strive. The plants will structure our soils too. So you see that guy thing again, it's all connected. We're all working together. Here's something that you can see. Here's a beautiful example of a continuous soil core network. Um, and then if you look over the side and you've got all those little rafters, those are poops, columbulin poops. And you know, somebody in Arkansas said to me, she said, wow, you are really lucky. You're the only woman I know and the only presenter I know that gets to say poop in public. <laughs> and, and it's legitimate. Okay, so we've got all the columbulin poop there, and you can see there's actually one up there that's made that great big hole in the middle of it. It's all about, also about structuring your soil better. And it gets even better than that. They're concentrators, their poop is concentrated with all the nutrients that they just chewed up. So all the bacteria that have started your plant, all the fungi that have started your plant, now they're chewed up and they're concentrated into a pellet that's also creating soil structure and also feeding your plant. So how much better can that get? Okay, so let's look at this. And the other thing is, is now let's put the plant back into this situation here. Plants in well-structured soil grow better. They grow faster, they're less prone to disease. They have more nutrition because they can access more nutrition. I mean, look at the way the roots are moving there. The other thing is, is that then they have more soil root interface which means that their roots are actually attached to the soil, which means they have access to more nutrition and more water. The other beautiful thing about it is that when roots sense that they're in an area with lots of great nutrition, they will actually form lateral roots and start branching into the nutrient patches. So they're all working together. Um, I did a workshop in Iowa in July, and um, in the past year, and and everybody from all around brought their root balls. I asked them to bring things to the workshop, and so I said, "Corn root balls would be great. Just bring bring plant materials and cover crops, bring anything you want." And um, well, and we had and Lauren extracted all his microarthropods, and he brought them. And um, and but what was really cool is there was this poor farmer from North Dakota. I shouldn't say poor, I don't mean it like that, but we ridiculed him pretty badly but he's a good sport. He brought this corn root, he brought his plant in, and it was scrawny, and the roots were just, you know, kind of few and far between, and the plant stunk. It actually smelled bad. And we were all like, oh, your plant really smells bad, man. And he goes, yeah, well, he'd, been in, he'd, he'd had problems with inundation, and he'd been rained out, and his plants were really bad. And then Sheldon comes in, and he's from I, he's an Iowa farmer, and he's got this root ball, and he's got like five layers of adventitious roots on his root ball, and they're all really concentrated in the top. But he had a cover crop, so they're just mining all the residues from the cover crop, as well as all these roots down below. And there was another farmer who had a really bad windstorm, and all his plants were like this. So where are all the crop roots? Here. So it would come back up. Plants have to stay in one place. They can't run away. So when you can't run away, you improvise. You are proactive and you defend, and that's what they're doing. Because it's all about reproduction. I mean, you're always trying to get that seed out there. Plants are trying their darndest to be for optimal yield. But you need to provide a habitat so they can have optimal yield. You need to make sure that the nutrients are in there, that they can have optimal yield, and the conditions are right. That's our responsibility as farmers. So let's go through this. That's what this soil looks like. That's what that soil looked like. And somebody said to me, he said, well, I put a deep rip through there. But that root is actually going through there. And you can see it, see? Here it is, coming through there, down here, and now it's going to come through somewhere in here. So it's making it. If I want to speed it up, I could do a deep rip. But what am I going to do after a deep rip? Solve the problem. So 
If I'm going to solve the problem, I'm going to grow a cover crop. I'm going to have deep roots. I'm going to have fat roots. I'm going to have something that busts that up. I'm going to solve it, and then I'm going to go back in. So what, if you're going to do drastic measures that cost a lot of fossil fuel, cost, you know, and are big iron and really rip things through, so you can solve your problem. Okay, so we're building soil structure. If you are going to trans, if you're transitioning to an organic system, if you are transitioning to a no-till system, it is important to start from a pasture or a cover crop because then you will succeed. The next thing is if you're transitioning to an organic system, make sure you transplant your brain so that you're thinking in a way of growing your own nutrition, making sure your soils are structured, managing your weeds and things like that. It's really important. You need to think differently. The other thing is, is when you're going to no-till, you can't just say, okay, I'm not going to till and do the same thing. That doesn't work either. You have to adapt to that too, because now you're not doing tillage, now you're not managing your weeds that way. Now I need to have companion crops. I need to grow living mulches. Now I need to do some other things. So I need to have good crop rotation because it doesn't work without crop rotation. It's about watching the whole movie. Not getting partway through and going, I've got time for this and then moving on. Mycorrhizas, we're gonna talk a little bit more about mycorrhizas. And we're gonna talk more about fruits. So, and obviously we're going to talk about earthworms. I should have put a tape measure down the side, but we didn't actually have one, and now I make sure in my bag I've got a tape measure. But, you know, we're sort of like four feet down here, and you can see old root channels. You can see the oxidized carbon around that root channel. Our objective here should be to have the full profile, full of roots, building the carbon right down. Now, what's the advantage of having carbon down below? We have more microbiology down below. So now we have living soils deeper. We have more aeration. We have more water infiltration. So now we are actually building profile. Now the other cool thing is that we are accessing nutrients that we haven't been accessed for eons. And now we're pulling them up too. So that's the idea here. We need to work on deep rooting. And earthworms. Okay, you can see the nice orange bands on these, and then you see all those little cocoons around there. They look like popcorn seeds. That's actually the eggs of the of the earthworm. And these two, because they have those nice orange bands, were actually pretty sexy, and we disturbed them, and you can see they were quite busy. Earthworms are called ecosystem engineers. And the reason that they're ecosystem engineers is because they really dramatically change soil physical structure. They also really dramatically change our, our biological structure too because as they open up the soil with more air, the other thing that they do is that the slime that's on them is rich in carbohydrates, rich in calcium. And plant growth promoting rhizobacteria will grow along that slimy edge. The slimy edge also, when it hardens, is quite rigid. So now it becomes a channel that allows water to flush down, allows air to move down. It's quite permanent at that point. So that's why they're building soil structure. They're increasing the aeration. It's wonderful. And then you can see roots are moving down there. Now why wouldn't a root move down? Not only is it easier, but then they have the advantage of all this plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, yeah, they've got all that too. And the other thing is, is that it's easy to move down, and the other thing is, is that when the crop soil flows down, then they're also in topsoil, so they've got all these nutrients. It's a good deal. So more on roots. Uh, lately, researchers have been spending a lot more time trying to understand roots, which is really wonderful, because um, before what we'll call the Green Revolution, um, we used to spend a lot of time thinking about roots and plants. Um, and uh, now we can see that, you know, we, plants are actually really changing the soil themselves. So they'll go deeper to find wetter subsoils, and they'll be shallow if it's raining and blah, blah. I mean, they are actually trying to grow roots, and they'll grow roots very fast. In, in order to access things that happen to them. So that's the other thing that's really cool about this, 
is that you the roots will respond to what we put where we put things and them. So I know that there's a number of people that are animal um, uh, livestock producers at the conference. So um, <coughs> these boots belong to Simon Park, Park Dairy in Wonsangi, Australia, which is uh, outside of Melbourne in Victoria. And you can see that is mostly ryegrass, and that is his typical dairy pasture, and his animals are all pastured. So they're pasture fed. Um, and right beside it here is the is where we dug it up. Now this took a lot. And I showed Simon's boots, but we actually had three big guys standing on there trying to get that spade in the ground so that we could take out the soil. And you can see there's not much structure there. You can't really see much room. There's no streaking of things. And then Simon had these other streaks in the field that you can see in the top photo where he had fed the sweepings from a seed floor, uh, from, a, from a seed company, for extra nutrition for the cattle. These were the dry cows, actually. And so he had them out there, and they'd grown. So there was actually some lettuce in there, and there was canola, which you can see. And there were quite a number of other plants in there. So then we dug in with where the other plants were. And now you can see the roots. And it was really funny, because when I went there, Simon's wife had asked me to come because they were going to make a big change in their dairy and she wanted and she said Simon and I have talked about that we need help to make this big change because we're going to change the whole thing. So I went there to help them do the change and I saw this out the window and I thought oh that's okay so Simon let's go tomorrow and we'll go dig out there. And he invited the whole dairy group. Well, I didn't know what was going to happen. I suspected what was going to happen and I was just grateful that it did. And so what happened was, is they were all standing on the spade and the ryegrass, you know, rocking back and forth, trying to get it in the ground. And then Big Sean, thinking that we really needed the biggest guy in the group to get it in, in those rows of the other plant, he jumped on it, went straight down, and he flew right off the front. <laughs> and we all went, whoa. And what happened? And, and then, and so then every every farmer in the dairy group had to get on the spade somewhere else and do that to prove that that was real. And so we had little spade digs all the way down because it was like, well, there's got to be something else to this. But the earthworms were in there. The soil had changed. Everything had changed. And all we had done is add a different plant. I'm not going to talk about this now, but pasture stitching is a reality. It works really well. Um, we call it stitching because what it really is is just putting other plant species into your pasture to control the nutrition and to work the nutrition and also to tap down into the nutrients that you're not tapping into with the And part of the reason we want to do that too is because we want the predators, and I can't say this enough, protozoa are just little nitrogen concentrators. That's all they are. They just zoom around eating bacteria and concentrating the nitrogen, and they do all that in and around the roots. If you have a pasture, of course, the whole thing is roots. If you're a row cropper, then all, it's all in your row. That's fine, it's just all in your row. But that's what we want, because all in that row means that we're concentrating the nitrogen around the roots. And what's also great about this is all that nitrogen comes out in the form that the plants can use. When earthworms are well fed, they exude ammonia out of their skin. When they're not that well fed, they exude nit nitrate. So it's a win-win, but the ammonia is plants really like that. Okay, people ask, I put the rice dry in here. I was in Arkansas in November and just about choked because they were burning all the rice straw. And if you've ever been in a rice paddy, rice straw is very roby. I mean, it is, you look at that and go, whoa, that is tough stuff. And they, and the other thing is, is that they've leveled it all and they've done all these other things about with it. And this doesn't have to be burned. This is a perfect example of stitching in, stimulating the decomposition, stimulating that environment, and using what you've got there to break down the carbon. The reason that they burn is because the next crop after here is starved for nitrogen. Well, of course it is. You've got all that carbon in there. It uses up every bit of nitrogen to break down because in order for organisms to assimilate carbon, they have to use nitrogen and phosphorus and zinc and all those other things. So if you load it up with carbon, they use everything else in order to assimilate that carbon. It makes sense, right? If I put you in a room with, a, with only candies in the room, and I left 
to there for a month, what would you do? You would eat all the candies. And you would use all the proteins and the fats in your body in order to use the candies to get energy. So we start to see what happens here, right? That's how this stuff works. Root candies, and they can be beautiful. This is the Monet cover crop. This is from Northern France. And we call them the Mourmillon. And it's beautiful. And, and, and actually, this is one of, one of Frederick Thomas' um, friends that did this because his wife was tired of looking at ugly cover crops. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, <laughs> he, he, Luke is really funny. So he told his wife, he said, I'm going to create this, this amazing cover crop for you, honey. And he said, and then, but don't expect anything for Christmas or birthdays or anything because I'm creating this amazing thing for you. And that's what he created. And she thought it was really marvelous. But the other thing that's really cool is when you do stuff like that, everybody's Christmas pack. You know, if you, if you went around Northern France, everybody's Christmas photos that they sent to everybody was in that field. You know. Okay, so salad beans, Persian clover, all these things are things that you can grow here. That you could use. Sun hemp, you're actually on the verge of using sun hemp. This is maybe a little bit north, but I'm not sure. Sun hemp forms these like little ping pong balls worth of nitrogen pictures. So it may it creates a really patchy nitrogen. Um, salad beans create a lot more roots than they create above ground biomass early on, which is what we want. We don't, we don't want to get to the bean phase if we're using them as a cover crop. Woolly cod veg is not I like it a little bit better than herring veg just because it's not going to have any insect problems, and a Persian clover. And um, if you're doing any of this, just ignore it says, oh, you can't grow that. Just try it anyways, because who knows? I know when I was growing Carrie Vetch out in um, Alberta, I bought the seed in Ontario. The guy in Ontario said, are you crazy? You're not going to be able to grow that. Well, it went. It was perennial, just like it should be. It worked fine. Intermingling of roots. That, so, this is, if you were in a pasture or a cover crop, this is what it would look like. They're all touching. They're sharing. Now we really have a network. The mycorrhizas have networked all the plants, and now a plant that has more water than it needs sends the extra water to somewhere else, and they're all sharing. Now that doesn't mean they don't like each other. That's about us finding the plants that like each other, and we need to do that. But if they all like each other, then there's no problem. They all share, and everything goes really well. And that's the kind of thing that we need to think about. We also want to pick plants that don't share and then get rid of I mean, there are some things that we can do. This is mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza can't grow without a host. They're fungi. They need a host plant. And we know that more than 90% of all land plants form mycorrhizal associations. Um, now, mycorrhiza have these big fat hyphae that go out into the soil and actually bind all the soil particles. And then they actually, and then because they leak glomalin, they glue them all together. So we actually get a much stronger soil. We get better soil aggregates. So that's all a good thing. But they do that not because they are, well, they like the plant. Sure, they like the plant. They're doing it very selfishly because they need the plant in order to grow. So they're trying to make that plant the best plant that it can be. So when a mycorrhiza colonizes a plant, it actually changes everything. Plants go to synthesize more because it needs to send more things down to the ground. More plant growth promoting rhizobacteria around the roots because it needs to protect the root. Animals will graze the hyphae and then lo and behold, mycorrhiza actually like a little bit of grazing because it stimulates rooting and so then they, they branch their hyphae and they grow further. So there's a lot of good things that are going on below ground that we can take advantage of. And corn and soybeans need mycorrhizae to grow. So great news, they support each other. Okay, so roots perform these vital functions. So you can see nutrient cycling, soil structure, it all works together. That's biology. Sunflowers. Well, these are the sunflowers. That, these are my sunflowers. This is a picture of my sunflowers. So I tried growing 80-day sunflowers in eastern, northeastern Washington this year. And they grew really well. And then the blackbirds descended. And they ate everything around the edge except for the center. So they just stood on the edge of the plants and they just ate out all the seeds. I was very annoyed. And now I have raptor stands all over the CRP 
so that they can so that my raptors so I can feed raptors to kill my blackbirds or at least scare them off. Um, but sunflowers are great. Not only did I have the bees on there, like there are two bees and then there's another beneficial insect there. It's actually a robber fly. Um, they have a big tap root. They're highly mycorrhizal. I put them in all my mixes because I think that they, they just have a huge benefit. Okay, David Tillman is a very important uh, and a very well-known, internationally well-known ecologist from the University of Minnesota. And all the grassland work that he did really helps us understand plant communities. Um, all the plant community work where plants interact and neighbors and understanding neighbors was done a very long time ago in Britain. It's also done by a Canadian, her name is Christine Pilou. And uh, she modeled, mathematically modeled, plant communities, native plant communities. Um, her work was wonderful and it's really seminal work. The only thing is it's highly mathematical. And um, so there were a lot, it, it hasn't had the popularity it deserves because most people can't understand it. Um, I'm going to work on that a little bit because I, I actually had the great privilege of being mentored by Christine. Um, the diversity of root systems alone, and that was the thing that was really important, that if we want to stabilize our agroecosystems, then it's all about roots. Because it was the roots that were stabilizing, not just the soil from eroding, but it was stabilizing the whole system function, right? Function. Okay, so the only thing I want you to take away from here is that root exonates as a primary source of carbon that is used in the rhizosphere, but also used in your soil to make stable aggregates. So it's all about the plant. And the most biologically active part of your soil, and I said biologically, I didn't say microbiologically, biologically active part of your soil is around the roots. It's in that root zone, it's in the rhizosphere. That's where it's all happening. So the more rhizospheres we can have, the more active our soils are going to be. And this is this is a wonderful book. The European Encyclopedia of Soil Biodiversity is a great book. It's just really unwieldy. It's huge. Um, but it has beautiful pictures in it. And um, the other one thing I want you to see the lateral roots up there. That's what I was talking about before. Plants will initiate lateral root when they get into resource patches. So they're trying to compete with the soil microbes too. But in doing that, they start to create more soil structure again. So the whole system is working together. This, this slide here is a really important slide. It's done by John Tate in 1972. I found it in an old book. So it's really important that the beans and peas exude four different nitrogen-rich compounds. The blue bars are nitrate, and nitrate we don't care about. I mean, it's no surprise that oats are a lot of nitrate because if you have a problem with wild oats, it means you have a lot of available nitrates. Um, barley, not so much. Corn, of course, needs nitrogen. It likes a good nitrate. Sunflowers as well. What was surprising was white clover, and some of our clovers are actually net users of nitrogen. So that's important when you're building cover crops and you think that you're getting nitrogen out of them, you go, well, that didn't work very well. I don't understand why that happened. It's because the clovers are net users, not necessarily net producers. So if you have residual nitrogen in your fields and you're growing clover, they're actually using it. They're not actually producing it. So we need to pay attention to that. Um, the other thing is, is that we don't. We also want amino acids, amides, and ureides because they're much harder to break down. So we also build diversity of the soil microbiology, which is also really, really important. The other thing about this slide, the reason I put it up, is because everybody thinks about sugars. Well, those roots, they leak a lot of sugars, but they don't. They don't. They leak a lot of organic acids. They leak a lot of amino acids. And if they're mycorrhizal, they leak even more. And they leak less sugar because the mycorrhiza uses the sugar and changes it over and trades it. The big carbon trader, they're trading it for phosphorus. They're trading the plant for photosynthate. So they can, and they give the plant phosphorus and zinc and molybdenum and some of these nutrients that are hard to get. So they're trading, they're carbon traders, that's all they are. But in doing so, they're taking away a lot of that photosynthate, but they want more amino acids and organic acids. So whatever they do, and we don't understand this yet, they actually make the plant make more of that and shift more of it down so that they can have it. So let's not just think about sugars, let's think about complex 
And um, very important, we're, we're actually, we've got some new varieties now from Washington State University that are winter hardy. Start growing those this year. So, harvest from roots, more stable. Roots account for a very small amount of total plant weight, but they contribute 12% of the organic carbon, 31% of the soil soluble organic carbon, and 52% of the bio, microbial biomass. It's all about roots, guys. It's all about root exudate. Now, here's the guy that is a monster. Now, look at that chomper. When I said it's about predator prey relationships, you can see now why. This little tank is going to go through everything eating its way through the organic matter, eating its way through each other, eating its way through all the bacteria and the fungi. Predator prey relationships. And you know, I know that's that you'll get. Now, another one. This is cotton harvest, just in case people haven't seen cotton harvest. This is cotton harvest. And you can see the round bale coming off the back. And this is what the soil looked like afterwards. And somebody said, well, cotton soils are dead. But there's a lot of earthworm activity that's happening in there. See, you can see all the poop that's on the top. So even though sometimes it looks dead, we can look for things. Now the other thing is, it's just that people all go, oh, how do I evaluate my soil, Jill? How do I know that my soil is healthy? Earthworms are probably one of the easiest things that you can do to evaluate soil health. If you've got five or more, good. If you've got eight or more, two thumbs. And if you've got less than five, <coughs> And it just means you got to do a little bit more work. If you got mint, and sometimes you're not going to find lumber stressors, the midden ones, the night crawlers. So that means you can count midden. So all you need to do is take the grazing square, put that down, and count the number of middens in there. Do I have three? Good. It's not that hard. It's a very easy evaluation. It just means that you have to do it, or you have to teach your agronomist how to do it. The amount of carbon from roots, and you can see here, more important than your above ground. And yet we focus on the above ground. Now that doesn't mean you can harvest all your above ground stuff and send it away for ethanol. That is not the case. That's my timer telling me where I am. So that's not the case. So we need to pay attention to that. So. The other thing that's cool is that when we start to increase the amount of root carbon coming down from the plants and increase the amount of root exudates, we get more enzyme activity, so we're breaking things down more. So do you see how things are happening again? We're starting to get nutrient cycling. We're starting to get those soils smoking. And that's our objective. So chlorophyll content, mycorrhizal fungi, <coughs> mineralizing, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus more efficiently and effectively. And that's what we really need to do, especially when we're going thinking about the Mississippi. We're thinking about the Great Lakes. That we're using it. So, cover crops, dry matter, nitrogen yield. Look what we've got here. I want, when I pick a cover crop, this is what I'm looking for. A very close biomass to nitrogen ratio. I want it to be very close. So that for every pound of, of, of biomass, I've got a pound of nitrogen. That's what I'm looking for is a very close ratio. And all those numbers down there belong to different mixtures. Then we look at phosphorus in there. The blue bars are really dry. We're dealing with 8 inches of moisture versus uh, 15 with the red bars. But what you can see are the trends are quite similar. But when you look at number five there, okay, let's look at the facilia. Look at how much phosphorus they're putting in, the oil seed radish and the vetch. So the thing is, is I can build plant communities that do things for me. And if I'm feeding this, because all this is feedable, then look at the nutrition that I'm creating. Look what I can do. I can actually modify my fields in order to get the nutrients that the plants, that, that my animals need. Or I think that actually plants are one of our best indicators. Now, I say this, and this is just a warning because I learned this the hard way. If you are a grazer and you are not going to crop the field, then go for chicory 
Chicory is great. Cattle love it. It's a very good food. It, it really, when things go bad, it gets too dry, it gets really wet, chicory will pick up and be your forage of it, and the animals will love it and it will keep your operation going. If you're going to crop that field sometime, think twice because you will have chicory. The other thing is chicory is awesome for pollinators. The bees love it. They just buzz around it. If you have an allergy, it's bad um, because the bees are just all over it. But it's just to be careful. Plants do. I put Basilia in because if you've got sandy soils that are totally unstructured, Basilia is your first choice. I am going for Basilia. Um, it's also great for pollinators, great for beneficial insects. It's a great plant. Um, but it really is specifically, in my view, I use it specifically when I need to make a soil, when I'm really trying to aggregate a soil or rehabilitate a soil. It's a tough plant. It was a native plant um, that was commercialized out of UC Davis and then taken to Germany and really worked on. And now we have it back. So, okay, this is the rise of your plants, organisms, soil, chemical. That's what we're looking at. That's what we're trying to do. Um, and again, it's the rise of here that really drives wellness, not of your plants, not just of the plants, but your animals and us as well. So let's think about plants. I think that plants are the great indicator. They're a vital indicator of what's in your soil. Your soils are really healthy. Your plants will be well. Because plants are trying to be well. They really are. They're doing their best to be well. Um, so there's root exudates, right? The deposition is a fancy word for root exudates. But I can put arrows on the ends of this because symbiosis is going in um, for sure, right the deposition going out, but then there's actually deposition from the symbionts going in. Nutrients are coming in and out because there's proton pumping, calcium pumping, all sorts of pumping that goes on in the root. The plants are actually changing the osmotic potential of the root all the time to attract things or to expel things. So they're actually actively transporting things, and people don't really understand that. Growth, inhibition, growth inhibiting substances. They, there's a lot of organisms doing that. All your pathogens do that. Why do they do that? To slow the root down. They need to get on. They're lousy competitors. It's like, slow down, I need to get on. So if the soil temperature gets cold and stuff, they can get on because the roots slow down, things slow down. If our soils are bad, poorly structured, we have some problems with disease because they can't move properly. Plant growth promoting substances, the bacteria that need more habitat, need more root, need more root exudates, they are promoting root growth so that they have their own habitat. So they're going, come on, let's go, produce more roots. We want more roots, we want more habitat. That's what's going on here. It's a thing. So, look at that rhizosphere on there, the soil that's attached to that. That is pretty much the rhizosphere, but it's not even touching the part that's really influenced by the root because the root has leaked all these things, because there's predator prey in and around the roots, because the soil is structured better. Um, this is about growing <coughs> two plants together. Something I think that we need to think about more. Um, this is desi chickpeas with wheat. And it allowed me um, not to spray anything, because I couldn't, because I, uh, if I sprayed a broadleaf herbicide, I'd be taking out my chickpeas. But my chickpeas, I was using desis because they're wild type. They come from Afghanistan, and so they really, they like cool in the spring and they like it really hot in the summer. Oh, that's perfect for me. Um, they like it really dry, they don't like it really humid, and that's also perfect for me. And they have really acid roots. They leak a lot of oxalic acid out of the roots, which means that it cleaves off the calcium from the phosphate, makes sure it feeds my plants phosphate, feeds them calcium, and actually breaks down some of my uh, calcium carbonate layer. So it's all good for me. So I experimented with this. Um, I put a little bit of fertilizer with the wheat when it started, and then I used the chickpeas to feed them, with the idea being that I was going to have these intermingling roots and it was all going to work together. And miraculously, it did. And we've been using this ever since. Now, there's another reason I did that, is because here in Lindy, showed that it wasn't just about high diversity, it was about the fact you had a legume in that diverse mix. So you'll notice in most of my mixes there was a legume. 
Because it's not about the fact of the diversity itself, just for the sake of diversity. It's about the ladies that are in there. Because they leak a lot of assets. So they're leaking things all the time. And that's the thing. It's all about the root exudates and what the root exudates are doing. So, you know, these are the things we need to pay attention to when we're picking. And, and I'm, I'm going to do, tomorrow, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about picking, I think. Yes, go ahead. Okay, would it, it, I'll repeat the question for everybody. Would it be better to have a deep-rooted legume in a pasture rather than a shallow-rooted legume? Um, or a shallow rooted clover. There are some deep rooted clovers. Um, like, well, and um, uh, it would be more like sweet clover. Um, and of course, alfalfa has the deep root. Um, I like deep roots because you've got a lot of shallow roots already um, in your pasture. You've got a lot of grasses. And so the idea there is to get something that's deeper rooted. And if we look at pastures like native range, a lot of you know our um, a lot of our legumes that are in there naturally have quite are a balance between deep rooted and shallow rooted, so that the whole profile is cycling nitrogen. So I think that's the kind of thing that we need to look to. And if we're doing pasture stitching, then I really am looking to solve problems or looking to nature for some of my solutions. So I think so. If you have if you're mostly shallow rooted, then I would go for something deep and stick it in there and start it going. Um, this is buckwheat growing with winter triticale. Um, this was the idea here. This was actually for harvesting both. Um, this is a hooterite field, and um, they had put a lot of manure on the field, and so what they were doing was mining the chicken litter with the buckwheat and then selling the buckwheat. Um, buckwheat very good for mining phosphorus, calcium. Root temperature. I know that we have a lot of roots to cut, a lot of acreage to cover. I know we do. But root temperature is really important. 20 degrees Celsius and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Optimum. And that's where you want, when, after you've seeded everything, you want your plants to be at that to really grow. You can see we don't do too bad at 15, and we start to get a little higher. So being a little on the cooler side is fine, but we don't want to have our corn seeds sitting there for two weeks before they sprout. That's a, just a recipe for disease, if we can help it. So the idea is to really pay attention to soil temperature and see if we can't get there. Um, you'll notice that when you do plant soil temperature, you do pay attention to it. How long does it take for a corn plant to get out of the ground? Yes, four days. Exactly. Four days it'll come right out of the ground. Uh, and, and, and if you dug it up, you'd have a little tiny shoot and you'd have a root that's about three or four times longer than the shoot. That's what you're really looking for. Optimum soil temperature means the, the mycorrhizae are also functioning at high speed. So, you know, that's the thing we're looking for. Now, these are all the different things that plants will leak. They're trying to mobilize things. They're trying to tie things up. They're trying to get things going. They're trying to do everything, and that's why is so important. And we want everything. We can take advantage of all of them. If I want to control weeds, I can use allelopathy. If I want to control diseases, I can use allelopathy. I can use plants for a whole lot of stuff. PLFAs, phospholipid fatty acids, are a way that you can measure. There's a number of labs that offer this. The one thing I'm going to tell you right now is this is the total. You need this for sure. You need to look at this. What we have is broadcast nitrogen, and then we have um, injected and hybrid, and then we have a rape clover mix, and then we have um, maize, uh, maize pro, which is a cover crop specifically for corn. And then we have a corn mustard, and then we have corn on corn. So you look at that and you go, oh, corn on corn. Now, this is the reason why you don't grow corn on corn. But if you just have the bacterial and fungal ratio, corn and corn doesn't work that bad. You've got to watch the whole movie. You can't just look at part of it. And, and what I say about this technique, the phospholipid fatty acids are about measuring living microbial biomass, which is really important that it's living, not just everything that might be in there. But the important part is, is that we do have, we've got an 8 to 10 
is a pretty good. If it gets low like this mice probe, round four, that means I've got a lot of fungi in there. Um, now I've got to watch the whole movie again because now I'm getting a lot of fungi. That might mean that I am a little low on carbon in that system. That may mean that I need to up the carbon a bit so that I get back up a bit. Because my, my fungi will actually hoard carbon a little bit and keep it as a slow release. need to work on that. The other thing, and most people don't know this, when corn gets attacked by corn root borers, it sends out signals, for heaven's sakes. It's trying to attract nematodes, but if you use them a lot in nematocyte, it can't get them, so that they'll actually parasitize and feed on the insect larva. That corn plant is trying to defend itself. You just need to let it. We're meddlers. That's what we are. Cheat graph, brown. Um, what I want to show you here is that plants are actually trying to do things. The reason why some of our weeds are so good at keeping everything out of us is because they're trying to. They're starving everybody around them for good reason. It's like, this is my territory and I have it. So let's pay attention to the roots. Let's ask our the people with the genetics out there. Let's ask them about roots. Ask them about protein. How efficient? How, how efficient are these plants? Are they breeding for efficiency? Are they breeding for drought resistance? Historically, we haven't thought about, you know, food so much. Even though we're growing corn and soybeans, we haven't really thought about the food aspect of it. And we've not been held accountable for nutrient output or efficiency. They're going to be. This is a 90 bushel wheat crop. I'm on 10 inches of water. That was 15% protein. Um, and this is uh, just showing that, that we can change things. All I want you to look at here, this is phosphorus, calcium, zinc, copper, man uh, magnesium, and potassium. And it doesn't seem to matter what I do to this slide now, it turns out white, so I'll work on that. Um, but let's look at the calcium, which is here. And see the blue bar here? The blue bar is where I added three, uh, a mixed species. It was three species in a forage. And I foraged the animals. And look what happened here. This is continuous wheat where I just keep throwing fertilizer on it that's why just to keep it up under every circumstance. And then also look at the zinc. Zinc is important for cognitive ability. And you can see that by adding a multi-species cover crop, I really changed things. So, there's some things that we can do, and this works for corn too. If you use ammonium sulfate, it'll increase the thiamine content. That's a B vitamin. If you have too much nitrogen, and this is the same for corn, then you don't have so much lysine, which is something that's really important for us. So there are nutritional aspects. It's about using the amount of nitrogen you really need, not the, oh, well, if this is work, then I'll just ensure that everything is okay. And actually, by doing that, we're actually, you know, making it less healthy. And this should be our ultimate goal. It should be that we are producing food that the media want to rave about. And that farmers are getting really good press because we are caring, and we are caring. But it's about getting that good press. And I know that's hard to do, and we need, but we really need to embrace foodies and and start teaching them and teaching our urban cousins about what we do and how well we do it and whatnot. And really start thinking about ourselves, even though we might be producing bulk commodities, but thinking about ourselves as food producers. I think that's really critical.